Good evening, everybody. You know, I uh, had some prepared remarks, but I'm going to go off script uh, <laughs> here on the, on the front end. Uh, I can't uh, come back to Carolina without all kinds of memories and recollections kind of flooding back, as, as with you all. And with some of you, I, mean, I go back to junior high school. Uh, I remember in student government and, and all kinds of things. And uh, well, I appreciate the positive comments uh, that have been made about me and your recognition so far. Uh, I had a, at least one experience at Carolina that made me wonder what trajectory exactly my career was going to take. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember it, uh, I lived in Granville South, and I was an orientation counselor uh, my second year, and we had done this, you go around the room, tell us your name and where you're from. So we just finished this, and then in comes two latecomers. And I said, oh, Kind of late, you know? <laughs> t t tell us who you are and where you're from. And he says, Michael Jordan from Wilmington. <laughs> and uh, I said, you, uh, You're late, what happened to you? <laughs> and he said, I had practice. I said, What practice? Basketball, I'm on the team. <laughs> to which I said, Yeah, right. <laughs> if, if you're on the team, I'm on the team. <laughs> and so that, that year, we, uh, we beat Georgetown in the championship. <laughs> from being Jerry to being Scrug, <laughs> to, which, to which he would then say, Scrug, you think I'm on the team now? <laughs> so turning back to uh, then uh, the reason I'm standing here is to talk a bit about the, uh, the, the show of the trial. Uh, the, the phrase that captured it all uh, was that the, the truth is that George Floyd died not because his heart was too big, but because Derek Chauvin's heart was too small. And, and that to me captured, it said it all about uh, the use of force case that the defense wanted to put on, uh, about the medical causation case that the defense wanted to put on, just to capsulize it in one sentence. This uh, trial ended up being the most watched trial in history, the planet. Uh, and uh, I heard from everybody, from China to Turkey to Peru to you name it. And at one point, I thought I was talking to a student uh, from a high school in Jordan, Minnesota, where you know my wife and I support scholarships. And I set up an interview with him, only to learn he was in the country of Jordan. And, uh, <laughs> <you know? laughs> and we had our interview anyway. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, uh, the motivation uh, behind uh, taking uh, the case in the first place. This is sort of the, the Chauvin trial deconstructed a bit, uh, things you wouldn't ordinarily hear or see or know about. Uh, at the time, I decided to uh, get involved to, to assist with this trial. Uh, I had lots, plenty, practically all of my friends who are lawyers who thought it was the most irrational thing uh, I could possibly do. Uh, it uh, to them made no sense. Um, I had no criminal law experience uh, at all. And on the, the civil side, uh, I was technically at the top of my game uh, then. Um, I had uh, a law firm I'd started that had been the firm of the year for uh, several years in a row in uh, Minnesota. In fact, so many years in a row that I was starting to doubt the recognition. That, <laughs> you know, um, and, and I had been the uh, attorney of the year uh, uh, multiple times beyond that. Uh, I. Uh, was, uh, was and am a trial counsel in uh, major litigations um, all over the country. You name the state, I probably have been in it, um, in some case or other. And this, in what we do, complex civil litigation, this is what you live for. And, uh, and I call myself as a trial counsel a smoke jumper because uh, I tend to parachute into cases uh, just months, uh, sometimes months, sometimes weeks before trial. And, uh, and you jump in and, uh, to, to try to win. I'm mostly for Fortune 500 companies. Uh, I had the uh, dubious distinction of never having lost one of my trials, and I'd had plenty of them. 
Now, I say that, uh, and I felt a little bit like the lone house that was standing after a tornado. So it's not that it's proud, it just is. And, uh, and, so, and so it is with uh, trying cases. It was just a, kind of an artifact thing. But for my friends, I said, why would you risk this? I mean, if you get involved in a case like this, uh, you can absolutely make a fool of yourself. Uh, and all of those corporate clients who are very conservative sorts um, who look to you will then look away from you. Uh, you could ruin your uh, reputation uh, doing this. If you lose this trial, if the state loses this trial, uh, everybody and their cousins, you all are cousins, uh, all the cousins uh, are going to say that part of the reason you lost is because you took the civil practitioner and put him in his inaugural prosecution case, and being this case, uh, the biggest, most watched case there is. So they said it uh, made no, no sense uh, to do it. So I want to talk a little bit about sort of what was my uh, thinking and what was the inspiration uh, kind of at the height of the game to do this uh, anyway. Uh, in order to do it, I have to uh, introduce you to what I call my, my alternate universe of, uh, of, uh, of being a trial lawyer. And this was the undergirding for the Chauvin verdict. Uh, and uh, if you just come with me for just one minute into my alternate universe, and, uh, and it is in, in some ways opposite land. Uh, when you're a trial lawyer, for example, and you get a compliment from your opponent, that is the most offensive thing there is. <laughs> you know? And uh, when the opponent says, I want to tell you this is the best lawyer I know, and they point to you, you're just like, who are you calling? Uh, I say, who are you calling a good lawyer? And, uh, and at the same time, uh, things that you'd ordinarily find insulting aren't necessarily offensive at all in the alternate land. So to give you some idea of what this uh, contradistinction looks like, um, when the distinguished uh, alumnus, alumni ceremony was taking place here, I was stuck in a trial in Independence, Missouri, uh, defending a 3M and couldn't get away. And at the same time that uh, here in Chapel Hill there was praise and panegyrics even, uh, and uh, here, here's what I was hearing about me in Independence, Missouri at exactly the same time. And I, 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 I took this down and looked at the transcript. So here's what I was hearing instead from my opponent. What you've heard, ladies and gentlemen, are just lies. And he's a liar. He wouldn't even dare to bring a corporate witness to put on that witness stand. He didn't call a single one. I would have crucified him, he says. He used that word. Uh, the truth is in the confidential corporate documents that the public was never meant to see. They tried to hide them and we finally found them. We had to use the power of the court to get those documents. And now you've seen their private whisperings and hidden truths, never intended to see the light of day. But you've seen them. You've got to hold this $15 billion company accountable for what it has done. Send them, send them a message they can hear. Maybe $1 billion is enough. No praise for me. Now. <laughs> so as I listen to this, uh, now ordinarily you think, well, to be accused of lies and liar and so on, was that offensive? No, uh, not at all. It uh, reminded me uh, a little bit, if I didn't go Shakespearean on you, of uh, a Portia and uh, the mer merchant in Venice when she said, uh, let music sound while he does make his choice. Then if he lose, he makes a swan-like end, fading in music. It's a swan song. This is the noise you make just before you lose. And, uh, and so, uh, and it was a rant, uh, as in Coach Dennis Green. You know, they are who we thought they were, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and so, and sure enough, uh, three hours we spent arguing, wrapping up the case with the jury, and in two hours and 15 minutes, there was a defense verdict. And, uh, and it uh, shut down the whole show. The whole show. But this particular alternate universe, my metaverse, uh, taught me a great many things, um, valuable lessons. And, uh, and, and one of them being that, that you know, praise uh, never makes me any better, nor does criticism make me any worse. Uh, I am who I am uh, before the sight of God in my own conscience. And so that's one lesson learned. And so when lawyers rant and rave and so on, I think, well, OK. Um, I go zen on them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, second lesson uh, learned from this alternate universe is that solitude is the price you have to pay to be great at anything. 
You have to spend lots of times locked up with yourself, in yourself, with your thoughts, wrestling with yourself. What will be your next objective? What about your fears? What about your doubts? What about you? And, uh, and you have to spend much, much time with yourself in solitude. Not necessarily isolation, but you do have to spend uh, much time in and, and the third rule of lesson uh, that I take from the Alton Universe, I call it uh, no muck, M-U-C-K, no muck, no lotus flower. And if you have ever seen a lotus flower, it's a beautiful flower with this multiple layers of petals and it's so bright and so vibrant. But the lotus flower grows in some of the dirtiest, ugliest, muckiest water you've ever seen. Tough terrain, roadsides, ditches. There you find the lotus flower when this, and its roots dig deep into the muck helps to purify wherever it takes root. And then it gives this beautiful lotus flower as a gift. And I find that uh, to succeed in, in taking on anything, uh, you have to be willing to sometimes plant your roots in the muck. And, uh, and not to be, take on the nature of the muck, you help to purify it, transform it, and you give the gift, which is the lotus flower. So take it on the Chauvin case, for example. There's plenty of muck. I mean, I couldn't live at home during that trial because of threats and things. But I understood, you know, no muck, no lotus flower. Uh, trying to deal with all of the, the issues and divisions uh, in the country. Blue lives matter, black lives matter. That's part of the muck. But then going into the muck, you have to go into it. No muck, no lotus flower. I understood uh, in, in taking on uh, this case that I would be racked with anxieties and concerns and fears, whatever you lose all of your clients. Even that kind of head trip was part of the muck for me. And uh, no muck again, uh, no lotus flower. So all of that was kind of a part of who I am, and I had been sort of gifted from an early age, to the extent you can say there's a gift from something as difficult as this, but I lost my mother at a very young age. She was 42, and I was uh, 17. And, uh, and one of the things that came out of that, that kind of loss early in life, uh, is uh, that I had always had a real grasp on my own mortality. And, uh, and, and, and the knowledge that any given day could potentially be your last. And for a lot of people, it's sort of a cognitive chiropractic adjustment when you have to think, how would you live your life if each day you got up and thought, this is what I have and this may be it? Well, that's how I came to live for having so much loss early on in my life. And that's considered a blessing in it, frankly, that I think that way. And, uh, and I've made many choices of things I either wouldn't do or put up with just because um, I don't necessarily, I'm not promised, I can't afford to partake in this tranquilizing drug of gradualism, you know, that, uh, that I have to be very clear and directed, and that was a gift I had. But why get involved in this case? And, uh, and you know, the world uh, for me was changing kind of all around me, even at the height of my own career. Uh, and I was sort of caught up in the riptide of these uh, changes. We all know about the changes in the outer world, whether it's the, uh, the pandemic, uh, mass shootings, uh, the uh, democratic instability of not the decline of democracy globally, environmental crises, um, you know, mass extinction, extinctions. Did the James Webb telescope establish that the Big Bang never occurred, right? And uh, I think that was a hoax, by the way. Um, <laughs> serious things. Uh, now, about those sorts of issues, I'm, a, I'm, an, op I'm an optimist. If I look at what uh, so-called modern humans have done for 50,000 years to bring us to this point, I think if we sent out party invitations for 50,000 years from now, uh, we'll all get there. We'll be there. That our moral intelligence will keep a pace close enough to our technical capability to kind of keep us in the game. I'm optimistic that way. So my motivation was deeper than that. And part of uh, what happened for me was that the, the blueprint, the blueprint for my entire work life and orientations in my work life had changed. Um, at the time I was born in 1962, the life expectancy for an African American male was 61.6 years in 1962. And so that's not just correct from an actuarial point of view. Along with it came certain facts about lifestyle, about how you live, about culture, kind of what do you do? And what I understood that I did was you get busy in what I call the becoming, becoming. Uh, you want to do as much good as you can, uh, to have as much opportunity as you can, 
uh, to have as much advancement as you can, and then to make as much money as you can. Wash, rinse, repeat, you know, over and over and over again for, for decades. I called it sort of my habit for success, that you just want to do as much good as you can, as much opportunity as you can get, uh, as much advancement as you can get, and make as much money as you can. And then one day, uh, in this process, you'll reach your drop zone. And uh, on the airplane, they will tell you that you have now reached the point where you can drop off. Now you can uh, retire. You have paid off your mortgage now. You can retire to the chair on the front porch. And in a few years, you'll die. And, uh, and that's considered the good life. You know? <laughs> and where I grew up, that's how people live. Sure enough, they paid off their mortgage. In a few years, they were uh, done and gone. Well, I was too close to 61.6 um, to, to believe that that was going to work for me, and I, um, I realized the world had changed. Uh, I no longer wanted to, in quotes, retire, as it was understood, as you know, I can quit my labors and no longer do my job. I was looking for a way to retire into what I do and not retire out of it, and, uh, which was uh, a new paradigm. And, uh, and, and my, my thinking, though, was still uh, evolving um, kind of within, because I realized that beyond the 61.6 and not wanting to just drop out, that a, a complete season in my life had, had just changed almost imperceptibly. I had gone from one season to the next. Um, I had gone through some 40 years of, uh, of becoming, uh, 40 years of, um, of the as much as I can. Uh, opportunity, advancement, uh, make as much money as you can. And then uh, just a little thought bubble started uh, to pop up in my head um, where questions began to rise with how much is enough, really? Uh, how, many, how many houses do you really need? Um, how many can you really live in? You don't want to pay the taxes on them. <laughs> anyway, um, you know, how much... Uh, how much more do you really need to make? Um, you know, what's really significant to you? And uh, what is really kind of at your core? How do you want to be remembered? And it was a, a pause and a break in um, what I call my habit for success. And uh, when I started asking questions about sufficiency, uh, don't I have enough? Um, how much is enough? Uh, what's significant to me? I always believe that life should be principally service. And anything you do, even if I own and ran a law firm, um, I don't consider myself just running a law firm. It's, it is a business that supports the families that work here. And I take on a role of stewardship here because I know they depend on this place to pay their bills, to send their kids to college, et cetera. So it's its own form of service. And you can take any job you do and convert it into something that is service oriented. Not always done that. But I wanted to do something that was more purely service. And it was in that space of, uh, of that thinking that I saw uh, what happened to George Floyd. And it just went through me like a shock that uh, uh, what it said about our own kind of basic humanity and decency and who we are as a people, if that can be OK. And, and I didn't know what I could do because I didn't have any criminal experience uh, at all. But I was just having my own private thoughts. I'd like to do something. I've, 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 tried a lot of tough cases in tough places, um, hard jurisdictions. Um, I'm hired quite often just to, to, to put a case together, kind of how do you form the narrative? How do you form the themes? Maybe there's something I can do to help here. And so no kidding, it was a Thursday, I remember having this thought, and then uh, on the following Tuesday, the phone rang. It was the Attorney General from the state of Minnesota asking, hey, could you help us on this case? To which I said, well, I don't have any criminal experience. He says, I know that. And, uh, but you try a lot of cases. Maybe you can help us with this case. And I said, well, uh, General Allison, um, I I'm happy to offer what I, what I can. But you understand that if I'm involved in this case and have any visible role, and if we lose, if you lose this case, everybody is going to blame you. And you're going to be around to suffer the slings and arrows of the political misfortune. You won't have to worry about me because I'll be vaporized. Poof. You know? <laughs> that, that will be over. And, uh, and so I worked uh, with the team, uh, you know, very closely, career prosecutors, just about all of them, 
And, uh, and I had different perspectives. Frankly, I, in some ways, I was more qualified to handle aspects of the case than they were because for 30 years, my cases have been at the intersection of law and medicine. So learning about different uh, kind of bodily systems and uh, addressing issues of causation medically is something I'm used to in my universe that most prosecutors weren't used to. And, um, and so that was another dimension that was brought to the case. But he said, I want to put in the best uh, people at each role. And as the world kind of turned on the case uh, before it was done, he, the Attorney General says, now, you know you're going to have to present this case, don't you? I said, well, no, I didn't know that. <laughs> and I uh, <laughs> didn't know that. And, uh, and after I said yes, it was uh, a week or two after that that he came and said, hey, by the way, did you know the judge is going to allow cameras in the courtroom? And I said, you mean like closed circuit, right? And, uh, and he said, <laughs> it's like, no, it's going to be televised. And, uh, and I have to say this, for, for you, those of you trial lawyers, you know what I mean. Every trial lawyer says, I can try any kind of case. You know, there, there is no civil jury or criminal jury. There is just a jury. And just give me a jury, and I'll, I can try any case. We all say that. But you don't expect anybody to watch. <laughs> <laughs> to watch you flop around on the stage. So, 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 um, so sure enough, I had many, many thoughts of kind of self, you know, what happens with the career and so on. But this to me mattered so much. It was the first time uh, in, in my life where I had seen something that had affected me so profoundly that uh, whatever it may have been the cost to me uh, didn't matter. Uh, whether that was uh, reputation, whether that was um, career, frankly, whether that was my own physical safety and, um, and, and their health. I felt that strongly about just the principles involved uh, in, in that case. Um, so the AG called, uh, answered the call, and, um, and agreed to serve that way. And, uh, and I'm, I'm glad I did it. And, uh, and it was a good result that, that frankly made it, it, it made, it was meaningful to people all over the planet. And it was interesting in some of the countries I heard from, some looked to America sort of as, as the beacon of, of hope, of, of, of liberalism, of, of inclusion, equality, and they cared about what happened here. In, in other countries, they simply translated the issues uh, with respect to George Floyd and Derek Chauvin into what was happening in their own countries and the relationship between the people and the state and the police authority. Um, and uh, interesting to hear from them, too. I wanted to, to stop, because that, that's the backdrop of kind of why I did it. My season uh, changed uh, in, my, in my own life. It's like a, the tide had been coming in for 40 years of becoming, and then I see it now going out, where I'm more concerned about um, how do I serve, what do I give um, from a planet that's given me so much. And, uh, and to stop for a minute and just pause and ask myself the question, don't I have enough of these other things? Enough of, um, you got enough of the material resources. You have enough of the recognition. Uh, I have enough. And, uh, and set that aside now and, and make it a focus and a priority to try to more just directly serve. And so that's what was happening and the way the universe was aligned that just as I was thinking that, I happened to get a call out of the blue from the Attorney General and it just matched up, and thank God my, my beloved, my wife, was fully in support of it because I was you know, very, very much concerned for her because it wasn't just me who couldn't live at home. We couldn't live at home and, uh, and had to go around with armed security, which is, um, I tell you, it's bizarre when you have to go to your office at uh, 4 o'clock in the morning because you want a notepad, and there's some person <laughs> armed who's uh, preceding you into the door to look suspiciously into a dark room and make sure nobody's in your office so you can get a notepad <laughs> out of your office. Uh, I did one day uh, uh, slip away from the security down the fire escape. I wanted to go home to do my laundry. And, <laughs> and so I did. Um, <laughs> so I, I, uh, I wanted to, to close with, uh, with a poem from, uh, from Langston Hughes, which uh, was always an inspiration for me and was even in the back of my mind when, um, when I decided to, um, to take on this case. And it always spoke to me, and it's called uh, Dream of Freedom by Langston Hughes. There's a dream in the land with its back against the wall. By muddled names and strange, sometimes the dream is called. There are those who claim this dream for theirs alone, a sin for which we know 
they must atone. Unless shared in common like sunlight and like air, the dream will die for a lack of substance anywhere. The dream knows no frontier or tongue, the dream no class or race, the dream cannot be kept secure in any one locked place. This dream today in battle with his back against the wall, to save the dream for one, it must be saved for all, our dream of freedom.